Amen. It's good to be here this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me this morning, please. In verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1, the Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I call your attention to verse number 7 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where the Apostle Paul said, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now God will share his peace with you and his grace with you and his power with you and all manner of thing, but he will not share his glory Amen. with anyone or anything. God Almighty will be glorified. And notice what the apostle says here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 7. He talks about an earthen vessel. In 1947, some kids over there around the Dead Sea uh, were trying to find their goats, and they went up into a cave, and they cast some stones back in there to see if the goat would holler, something like that, find it, and they heard a jar break. They went back into the cave, and lo and behold, they came upon a number of jars that were 2,000 years old. These jars, being earthen jars, of course, uh, were uh, subject to breaking and uh, brittle, but inside those jars were ancient scrolls, and they're called to this day the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they have revealed an enormous amount of material and information about what life was like 2,000 years ago. For example, the people that lived in what's the area called Qumran uh, literally hated the temple uh, worship and what went on in Jerusalem for they felt like that it was apostasy, it apostatized. So therefore they withdrew themselves to the area of the Dead Sea so that they could have a, a more purer walk with God, a cleaner understanding of God and His Word. And so therefore, 2,000 years ago, they wrote these scrolls and they put them in these earthen jars and there they stayed for 2,000 years until these people found them right after the end of World War II. It was in 1947 when they began to discover the scrolls, and it took them a long time to find all of them. But they started finding them in 1947, and they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the point is this, that the earthen vessel that the scroll was in was not much, but it wasn't about the vessel. It was about what it contained, and what it contained is priceless. What was inside those earthen vessels is priceless. And what is inside your earthen Amen. vessel Amen. is priceless. Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he talks about this earthen vessel. It is a direct reference to this body of frailty that we live in. It is not about our body. It's about what's inside it. Amen. And so the Apostle Paul said that what we have inside us brings glory to God. For by observing the fact that within you, God has placed a treasure that is unbelievable, yes. that is immeasurable, yes. that there can be no price tag placed upon it, 
that it is the treasure that is in the earthen vessel that brings glory to God. And the way that God does things, I mean, would you do that? Would you not find the strongest vault that you could possibly find? Would you not find the strongest container? If you had something priceless, would you take it out here and bury it in a mud brick in a hole somewhere in the ground? Or would you not put it in the most precious uh, p possession you possibly have, put it in the, in the most powerful, strongest thing that you could possibly do? This is the wisdom of God. For God Almighty is not about your body. He's about what's in it. And so the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 7, that is a treasure that's in a vessel and it manifests the power of God. We're going to look at those three things, the treasure in the vessel that manifests the power of God. Some folks can only see the vessel. That's all they can see. That's all they talk about is the earthen vessel. They watch each other. They're good at it. Oh, how they do. When they leave the church service, they couldn't have heard a word the preacher said, but they can tell you what so-and-so had on. They can tell you who was sitting with who, and they can bring you up to the latest gossip because their life is all about the earthen vessel, all about the cracks, the crevices, and the, and the, and the problems with it and what have you, the blemishes, the earthen vessel. Friend, I hope your life's better than that. I hope somewhere along, I hope somewhere in life that you pass that point. I hope somewhere in this world that you get your eyes off men and put them on the Lord. <laughs> You'll never get anywhere watching men. The only things that are going to happen to you by watching men are going to get further and further and further away from God. Because I guarantee you Satan is good at picking out the imperfections of all of us. And believe you, believe you me, I have imperfections. And everybody else in this house does. And if you're one of these people that hide behind imperfections, oh, do you have a labyrinth to hide behind. You can hide behind everybody in this auditorium. Talk to some of you about the Lord, and all you can do is bring up somebody else so you can hide behind them. Well, so-and-so did this. So-and-so is this. So-and-so is this. How about you? How about you? And not so-and-so. Quit running behind people and hiding behind people and making excuses for your walk with God. Grow up and accept some responsibility for who you are. So there are those that all they can do is inspect the vessel. Then there are those that have a spirit of discernment about them. They can see the spirit in the vessel. Amen. And that's a wonderful thing. Because you're not so easily fooled by a bunch of words that you can detect spirits. If an individual has the right spirit, my friend, that makes all the difference in how that you warm up to them. And they've got the wrong spirit. I don't care if they say the right thing. They'll drive you away from them. You ever been around anybody like that? Wrong spirit, right words. A lot of people, friend, that are legalistic, they preach the letter. They preach it to the cross, the T, and dot the I. But the Bible says the letter killeth and the spirit maketh life. Amen. We cannot do anything without the spirit of the living God. But there are those that think by rote memory, by writing everything down and handing you their list, that they can force you to live for God. You can't do that. So there are those that can see the spirit of the individual. Then there are those that not, my friend, look at the vessel and not so much the spirit. They look beyond to the one who sent us. They look above. They raise their eyes up into the heavens. And they realize, my friend, that we're all frail creatures passing through this veil of tears. And they have a right understanding of themselves. They really begin to understand what they're made out of. And that helps their relationship with God. Because if you really begin to see yourself the way you really are, it'll give you an appreciation of the grace of God. It will. It'll give you an appreciation of the grace of God. Amen. Oh, how easy it is to condescend down to people around you. And become God's high sheriff and judge of everything. Hypercritical of everybody. If they don't do everything exactly the way you think they ought to do. Your eyes not on God. Your eyes on people. And you're dying in your soul. Do you realize that? Do you realize, my dear friend, that if when you take your eyes off of the Lord, you start to die at that very moment? You want to know why you have no prayer life and the Bible's dead to you and you have no desire to live for the Lord? It's because you're dead inside. And you can't blame anybody for being dead inside. 
but yourself. Amen. So I want you to look at a few things with me this morning. I want you to notice what Christmas Stone said about the treasure. He said, lest any should say, how then is it that we continue to enjoy such unspeakable glory in a mortal body? Paul replies, this very fact is one of the most marvelous proofs of God's power that an earthen vessel could bear such splendor and keep such a treasure. And that's the wisdom of God. You ever felt the power of the Holy Ghost? Or you know what I'm talking about. The real power of the Holy Spirit of God. Not something that you were worked up to with a wrap and a rock, but something that came inside and began to grow and bubble over until it came out of you. If it's real in here, it'll be real out there. Amen. The vessel's a fragile earthen vessel. It's a man or a woman. It's a creature made from the dust of the ground. And the Bible says, the apostle said, that in my body dwelleth no good thing. But the body being a container holds within it a precious, precious treasure. And that treasure is what God put in you when he saved your soul. So what is that treasure? Well, now think about this. It is the witness of the Holy Spirit of God to the saving grace of God. I'm surrounded by people all the time and they don't have an answer to anything. I looked at a young girl yesterday sitting on the side of the road just as yellow as she could be. I've never seen one more yellow in my life. I've seen a lot of people sick in the hospital. I felt so sorry for her. This lady right back here in the back, Martha, went up to her and called the police to come and get her because she was delusional. She didn't know where she was. She didn't know what was going on. Her body is full of toxins. Do you know why? She has hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is destroying her liver. When her liver is destroyed, it does not function and cleanse the blood like it should. What happens? Your body builds up all these toxins. You are literally poisoned to death. And, her, and that's what's happening to her. Being poisoned to death. And you know what I felt for her? I felt compassion. I went home yesterday and I got on my face after we had this prayer, after, after we had the, the funeral here. I went home, got on my face, and I prayed for her. Yeah. I don't know her name, but I prayed for her. Amen. It brought something from the inside of me that said, Lord God, help that young woman. <laughs> she's in her 20s, and, she's, and, her, and, her, and her body's dying. And let me tell you something here, young, young people. Hear me well. Drugs will kill you. Amen. Oh, I know. I know there are those like Colorado, the state of Colorado, that says it's okay to smoke dope. Sure, I know all about it. Colorado, no doubt, is making a lot of money off their dope, too. But Colorado's going to pay a supreme price later on when, when the ships come home. Most of the time, marijuana is a gateway drug. So what do you mean by that? They, they, they progress from marijuana. They graduate from it to something stronger and something deeper. And drugs will kill you. And so the earthen vessel is a fragile vessel. We're subject to sin and to decay and disease and sorrow. All of us in this house today. But let me tell you something good about all this. God put a treasure in that earthen vessel and he uses them. Let me give you some illustration of the Bible. He uses people. He uses weak people. He uses broken people. He uses people who are ready to quit and give up and don't have an answer. He uses people for the glory of God. The problem with religion is religion says, I'll clean myself up, make myself better, prepare myself, and here I am, Lord. I'm presenting myself to you. I've done it. Here I am. What do you want me to do? And God says, I can't use you. God says, I don't have any use for you. Says, what do you mean you don't have any use for me? Because everything you are is what you did. The only one God uses is the one that God molds. Now think about a potter sitting at a wheel and think about the water in his hand and the piece of clay spinning before him think about the fact that the potter with his hand in the water and on the clay if all he did was hold his hand on the clay and did nothing more what would ever happen nothing he's got to push it he's got to press it he's got to form it when he starts pushing and he starts pressing and he starts forming it doesn't feel good when life begins to get hard for you and you're ready to throw up your hands and quit and say, Lord God, where are you? He's right where he's always been. 
He's beginning to answer your prayers. You say, preacher, I want peace. God will send you peace. Yes, he will. But peace and patience go together. And do you know how you get peace and patience? Tribulation. Everybody's got it all figured out in their mind about how they're going to clean up their life and how they're going to become more spiritual and how they're going to walk with God and how they're going to live for the Lord. When all along you're resisting the hand of God on your soul. God never used anything until he broke it. When he took bread and gave it to his disciples, he blessed it and break it. And when he break it, he handed it to them. And that's what he's going to do with your life. He's got to break you down and make you what he wants you to be. Did you know that Noah got drunk? But Noah was the one, the Bible tells us, who preached 120 years and built an ark. A drunk. How many of you would listen to that drunk preach? Did you know that Abraham lied about his wife? That's right, brother. Two times. You say, well, now, what did he lie about? What did he say? She's my sister. Was she his sister? She was his half-sister. But she was his wife. But he followed God out of idolatry and made the greatest act of faith in the Old Testament. If you're a believer in Christ today, you're a believer in Christ because of Abraham. It is through Abraham's faith that you have faith. It is Abraham's faith that laid the foundation for your faith. Yes, it did. Yes, he did. Did you know that Sarah laughed at God when she found out she was going to have a child? She laughed about it. Great woman of faith. She laughed. But did you know she had Isaac? Do you know why she had Isaac? The Bible said by faith in Hebrews chapter number 11, Sarah received strength. Once she got over her laughing spell, it was time to come to reality with the Word of God. That's the way a lot of people are. They put on the show, but when they get alone, they start thinking about, well, maybe there's something going on here. There is something going on here. Did you know that Jacob was a deceiver? Yes, he was a deceiver. Yet he became one of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe in the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. If you get that formula right, it'll get you about 90% right most of the time. If you get the right God in the Old Testament, you'll get the right God in the New Testament. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Did you know that Rahab was a harlot? Some of the new Bibles and some of the new preachers like to say she was an innkeeper. They want to clean her up. Rahab was a whore, folks. She sold her body on top of the walls of Jericho. How long she'd been that, I have no idea, but I know this. I know when the spies came, she received them. She believed them because of what she had heard already about what happened when they came out of Egypt. The word had spread fast, and she believed it. And do you know what happened? Because Rahab believed the spies and believed what she heard about God, she saved her family and became part of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter number 1. Amen. 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 Does God use broken vessels? Does God use imperfect vessels? Does God use people that have flaws? Does God do this? Did you know that Gideon was full of fear? Gideon was a fearful man. He certainly was. You know the story about all they did finally wound up with the men who lapped water like a dog. But did you know that uh, he became victorious warrior for God? He overcame his fear. It's easy to be fearful. It's fearful. Most of the time, fear is associated with the unknown. You don't know what's going to happen. Fear. Fear hath torment, the Bible says. Fear is a horrible thing to live with. Fear will suck the very soul, suck the, suck the life out of your soul. Fear will do that to you. But he said, in the case of Gideon, he became victorious. Samson had a serious problem with lust and anger. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He had a problem, folks. He went down to a prostitute. Samson had a problem, just like Judah did in the Old Testament. Yet he manifested the power of God and God's sovereignty when he pulled that temple down upon Dagon and upon all their gods. Amen. Eli failed as a father, completely failed. Eli the priest, he failed. 
He was a failure. You know what happened to Hophni and Phoenix? Went out into, went into battle against the Philistines. What happened to them? They were killed on the field. The ark of God was taken. They came back and told Eli what had happened. The Bible said he was heavy. And he fell over. Died. Broke his neck. Because of what had lost his children. He lost them. That's one of the worst things that can happen to you. Nothing will grieve your soul any worse than to watch your children go bad. That's one of the worst things on this earth. No new car, new house, bank account, fine clothes, la, la, blah, blah, will ever take the place of your children. You talk about an abject failure. Eli was a failure. Yet God chose Eli and used him to teach Samuel what it was to hear the voice of God. It was through Eli that he said to, to, to Samuel, he said, Samuel, when this voice comes again, say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Eli did have spiritual discernment. Even though he couldn't do anything with his children, he had spiritual discernment. Did God use Eli? Yes, he used him. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Yes, he was. He was an adulterer and a murderer. Yet he wrote this. Have mercy upon me, O God according to the loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and the hidden part Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I have no idea how many sinners have gone to Psalm chapter number 51 and read that on their knees with hot tears flowing down to the Bible as they poured their soul out to God as they got right with the Lord. And they used that scripture, that scripture right there, that scripture speaks to the heart of a man, and that scripture speaks to God. If you want to tell somebody what Bible to read, what part of the Bible to read, to help them get right with God, take them to Psalm 51. If you want to tell somebody what kind of prayer they ought to be praying, if they need to get right with God, take them to Psalm 51. David's the one that wrote that. Do you know why he wrote that? Because David knew what conviction was about. When Nathan came to him and said, Thou art the man, David, he didn't condemn him, he convicted him. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Some of you have lived under a blanket of condemnation all your Christian life. That's all you've ever known is condemnation. Condemn for this, condemn for that. There's nothing free. You can't do anything. Everything you do is wrong. There's no hope, no peace, no joy. Nothing can be found right. And you've lived under that your whole Christian life. And let me tell you where that's coming from. It's coming from Satan and not God. He's a liar and a deceiver. But you've lived under that all your life. Conviction lifts up the cross. Conviction opens the heart. And conviction shows you the blood. Conviction will draw you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Conviction will get you right with God. But condemnation will drive you further and further and further and further away from God. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. David was convicted. When Nathan said that to him, he made no excuses. He turned around. He went off and he got on his face. And you know, of course, the Bible history is little boy. God put the sin of David on that child. And David laid on his face and he fasted and prayed until God took that baby home to be with him. Yes, there is a difference. Solomon married foreign wives that turned his heart toward idolatry. He did. But God used Solomon because he built the temple of the Lord and he wrote this. Listen carefully. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tisra. Comely as Jerusalem. Terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Solomon wrote that. What's that about? You know what that's about? That's about the Shulamite as she appears to Christ in typology in the Song of Solomon. And Christ sees her even after she has rejected him when he came to the doorknob and put his hand on the door and she wouldn't let him in. So he put that myrrh on there and she knew who he was. And she went out into the street to try to find him. He wasn't there. But he came back to her. And he came back to her and he said, you're beautiful. You're still beautiful to me. You understand what he's saying? 
Solomon is saying, I still love you. I still love you. I know your weaknesses. I understand your frailty. Please understand this. In Hebrews chapter number 7, when the Lord Jesus Christ endured what he did for us. Chapter 5, verse 7. When he endured what he did for us, he did it so that he could sympathize with you as a sinner. I didn't say he would condone what you did, but he sympathizes with you as a sinner. How so? He understands the frailty of your life. This is why the Bible says, He remembereth our frame that we are but dust. This is how he's able to save to the uttermost. It's when you fail, he never fails. It's when you turn from him and backslide, he's ever present. It's when you have put yourself into a position where you've got all these do's and don'ts drawn up and created this little world of purity and holiness that you think is going to please God, and then somewhere along the line, you fail. I feel sorry for legalists when they fail because most legalists, when they do fail, they can't make it because they don't know what the grace of God's about. They can't handle it because they've had themselves pumped up so high. They feel like they're God's anointed and God's chosen. And as long as I keep my list, I'm okay. And that's how they feel. Then when they fail, Man, is it hard. Most of them wind up dying. A lot of them die at their own hand. They just can't handle it. What's grace, preacher? What's grace? What's grace? Grace is this. Grace is Lord Jesus. I started out on fire, and I meant everything I said. And I had this idea in my head what I was going to be like and what the Christian life was going to be like. And for a while, everything went okay with me. But then something happened, and I wasn't prepared for it. And now I've backslidden. I'm out of church. I threw my Bible down, and I quit. But in spite of all of that, Lord, yes. you want me back, don't you? And you're willing to forgive me. Can I really believe that you're willing to forgive me, Lord? And you'll take me back? That's grace. You see, grace is where God does something for you that you don't have to qualify for. And you don't have to deserve. But he does it for you. Now, if grace is working in your life, this is so important. Please hear me. If grace is really working in your life, you're growing. So how do you know that? The Bible says grow in grace grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't grow in law. You can't grow in do and don't. But you grow in grace. How do you grow in grace? Just like I told you. From faith to faith, victory to victory, a life consecrated and dedicated to God that gets its eyes off of men and puts its eyes on the Lord. Never making excuses for your sin or their sin, but you're looking to someone higher than you because you want something better. Grace lifts you up from the dunghill, from the gutter, from the slavery of sin. Grace draws you near unto God and brings you into his presence. Not because you feel like you deserve being there. Not because you've earned it. Not because somebody told you you were good enough. Grace says, Lord, I've been burned enough. I've been hit, stomped, kicked, pushed down, run over. I've been hurt in church. I've had people talk about me like a dog. I've had the people that I put, my, put most of my trust in turn on me like a rabid dog. I've had it all happen to me, Lord, but it doesn't matter anymore. Amen. What matters is, Lord, i got to have you. Because I want something better. Like Mary, when she sat at his feet, she chose the better part. That's what growing in grace is about. It's saying, Lord, I want victory over this. 
that I'll never get victory over anything by doing and don't do. I get victory over it by receiving grace, by strength, by spiritual sustenance. That's what grace is about. That's what grace is about. And you'll quit hiding behind people. And you'll quit blaming everything under the sun. And you'll start coming to a well that will never run dry. You'll drink of the fresh, 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 fresh water. And you'll plead for that filling of the Holy Ghost. Because you know as well as I know, if you have any spiritual maturity about you whatsoever, you'll know that the arm of the flesh will put you down. And the only power we have over Satan is by the power of the Holy Ghost. And the only way that the Holy Ghost will ever have power in our lives is when we yield to him and acknowledge how helpless we are. Folks, every one of us in here this morning are completely helpless. And we've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Well, we're, we're finished. We're done for. So... Elijah struggled with depression, yet he showed the children of Israel who the real God was. Jonah ran away from God, yet he preached the greatest conversion message in the Old Testament. He had over 100,000 saved at his preaching. That'd be something to see, wouldn't it? Fill up UT Stadium over here and every one of them got born again. That's what happened for Jonah. And then Peter denied Christ. But here's what he said. You want to hear what Peter said? He said, beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, yeah. and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. How far off do you mean? What do you mean far off? Well, I can look back 60-something years. I can look back a long way, and I do a lot. <laughs> when you get my age, there's a whole lot behind you, a lot that I can look back to. I can't remember every detail of all I've told you before. God's blessed me with a horrible memory. That's a great blessing. If I remembered every dirty deed that was ever done to me and every dirty thing that was ever said and every, you know, I'd be going screaming mad. So it's a great blessing not to be able to remember all that. But, boy, there are things I do remember. I remember them. I do remember them. I remember what I was before I got saved. How'd that happen, friend? What in the world am I doing up here before you preaching this morning if it hadn't been for a work of God? How'd that happen? Man, I, she, my wife didn't marry a preacher. She married a drunk, a blaspheming drunk. That's not too smart on her part. I mean, you know, you think about it. <laughs> not put anybody down, but, <laughs> but that's what I was. I was a blaspheming drunk. How'd that change? Somebody tell me. Well, now listen, folks. If you think I changed because somebody wanted me to change or I changed to be accepted in somebody's group, you don't know me. Right. You don't know me. How come me to change? What happened to me? <laughs> oh, I wish I could live the rest of my life in that week out right after I got saved. I do. My feet never touched the ground. I don't know how in the world I went back. And I was a line mechanic right after I got saved. I was a line mechanic. I used to work on people's cars, valve jobs, tune up, all kinds of stuff. You know, I did all that, brake job, did the whole nine yards. I was a professional mechanic. I don't know how in the world I did all that. <laughs> My mind wasn't a bit more on what I was working on. <laughs> Put a set of points and plugs in one time the thing and all that, you know. Here I am with a timing, timing light and watching that dot down there on the wheels, that thing move, checking to see if it's got spark advance and all that. Why, man, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the Lord. That's all I thought about. I couldn't get enough of him. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That ever happened to you? I couldn't get enough. <laughs> 
If you'd seen me a month before, you'd have heard me blaspheme, man. You'd have, oh, the filth that had come out of my mouth. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it all changes. <laughs> How do you explain that? <laughs> he's good. Oh, he's good. Oh, he's good. Oh, he's good. I serve a good God. Oh, yes, he's good. He's been good to me. Oh, I count it a privilege. Oh, what a blessing to be able to stand up here and talk about him, speak for him. Oh, he's a good God. You know the God I know? He's good. He's always good. He can't be anything but good. Well, I didn't deserve him coming to me. I didn't deserve being saved. I didn't deserve the grace of God, but he did. Oh, boy, how he did. I'll never forget sitting on that front row, Third Creek Baptist Church, Bill Cardwell up there preaching, Gene McDonald on my right side. Sit down there on that front pew. That's where I headed, folks, right after I got saved, right to the front. <laughs> Sat down next to him and Gene McDonald every time the preacher would say, Amen, 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 Amen. Didn't take me 10 seconds. Amen, 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 Amen. The only thing I cared about was what that preacher was saying from that pulpit. I know what anybody was wearing, who was there, who was doing this, who was doing that. I didn't look at him, didn't care. I was on the front row taking in what that brother, and you know something, folks? It spoke to me. I could hear it now. I could understand what he's talking about. He was good. It fed my soul. When that man preached, he spoke to me. I'm telling you right now, spiritual things begin to come into me that had never been in me before. There was something inside me that hungered for what he was saying. Where'd that come from? <laughs> I didn't put that in there, but I believed. I believed. I believed. I believed. <laughs> I believe. So I want to, as long as I'm on the face of this earth until God's done with me, I do not ever want to forget what it was like before I got saved and then when I changed. And that moment, I mean, I changed. And I didn't change. He changed me. And glory to his name. Yeah, he's a good God. He's a good God. <laughs> he's a good God. A few days ago, Rex Sumter was coming down to the last few moments of his life. He was finished here. His old body was given out. The old house of this tabernacle, earthly house, house of clay, this jar of clay. It was about done, but he wasn't done. Oh, no, 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 no. It was just beginning for Rex. Yes, amen. Amen. He raised his, raised his hand up in the bed. Raised his hand up in the bed. Big smile came on his face. He started reaching up there as if to say, can't you see it? <laughs> can't you see what I see? And the nurse said, that's for him. He sees it. And there wasn't any time he was gone. Gone. He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> oh, the heritage of the saints. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> Can't you see it? Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. You know him? Yeah. I didn't ask you if you believe in a bunch of <laughs> doctrines and catechisms and you've been confirmed and approved. I ask you if you know him. Yeah. <laughs> it comes down to this one simple thing, folks. One simple thing, and I'll shut up. He that hath the Son hath life. Amen. Because the Son is life. Right. Bless his holy name. He that hath not the Son hath not life. The wrath of God abideth on him. That's the question you ask yourself. Do you have the son? <laughs> Every time I go now at the emergency room, I've been three times in the last few weeks. Wound up in the hospital twice. I go in there and sit around, cross my legs and look around the wall and sing, go on. Say, what if you're about to die, preacher? Just keep singing, looking around the wall. Amen, Amen brother. Amen. 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 God knows. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Ain't nothing better than that. Ain't nothing better than that. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Amen, brother. 
I believe you do, too. Yeah. I do. No yeah. doubt in my mind. Yeah. I believe Gary West knows where he's going. Yeah. <laughs> you know where you're going, Brother Chandler? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you wouldn't take that away from a man would you you can't take it away from him <laughs> not your power he's a good God bless your holy name Lord my life is in your hands I say it every day every beat of his heart is in your hands my life, my soul, my future, my spirit, I bless thee and I love thee. In thy name I pray. Father, in thy name, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Stand up here this morning.